Evening everyone and welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton and this is the home of positive populism, pro-worker, pro-family, pro-community and exceptionally pro-America. So, with all the news going on, the Taliban situation, the jobs report and the economy, Congress returning tomorrow, guess what story? Chuck Todd opened NBC's flagship current affairs show with this morning. With jaw-dropping bias and anti-Trump hysteria, they led with the Sharpie weather maps thing. Of course, in one sense, that's just laughable, but it's serious too. A healthy, open, pluralistic democracy depends on journalism that people can trust, news and opinion. This was a massive misjudgment today by Chuck Todd and his team, but it was also helpful because it confirmed what people have suspected. Chuck Todd is not a news host, he's an opinion host. Meet the Press, which is a show I enjoy, by the way, is not a news show, it's an opinion show. They should just be honest about it, like we are here. And joining me tonight with their excellent opinions on all sorts of topics are Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn, Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and columnist for the Washington Post, Henry Olson, and Fox News contributor Lisa Booth. And also, we have a secret special <laughs> surprise guest later on in the show, so you're going to stay tuned to find out who it is. Let's start now with the big news of the weekend, these talks with the Taliban that the president called off at the last minute. Lisa, um, I've seen all day long establishment types jumping up and down and saying, oh, the harump thing about how this is outrageous, what were they doing being invited to Camp David and so on. Um, I didn't hear that kind of tone when the kind of in the Bush Cheney years and during the Obama years when all these problems were being created. The president, it seems to me, is just trying to clear up their mess. Well, and the president clearly has an emphasis on this personal diplomacy, right? He likes to sit down with people. We've seen that with North Korea. He's also opened the door to sitting down with Rouhani and Iran as well. I will say, in fairness, I don't think it is the best look to be sitting down with the Taliban in the United States at Camp Davis, David right before September 11th this week, right? So I don't necessarily think that was the best look. Well, but it also be might be- It wasn't supposed to be a look. Well, true, that is a good point. But I also think perhaps part of the reason why we've seen, you know, Sharpie Gate continue is some of the news for the president hasn't necessarily been that great this week. And he's kept the emphasis off it by keeping the Sharpie Gate thing going. And I think it demonstrates that President Trump is a master at controlling the media narrative and driving the news cycle, and he does so intentionally, which is part of the reason why we saw in the 2016 cycle, he was able to get something like $6 billion in earned media because basically he put out a shiny object and then the media follows it. Yeah. It's kind of remarkable. But I just, just on, on the, yeah, you know, I, I think, look, and there's this book out saying that, you know, like actually t t talking about his, um, his, his skills right. at that kind of um, media, uh, that kind of media approach, but on the on the you know behind all that, there's serious substantive work going. I think that's what's often overlooked yeah. um, with this administration, and it seems to me that that this emphasis on intervening on a, on a personal level to try and resolve these disputes that the establishment, for all their fine words about the proper diplomatic channels, they haven't got anywhere with North Korea. They haven't got anywhere with Afghanistan, so why not try this? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I happen to support the president, and I think we should be trying to get out of Afghanistan in a respectful way. You know, when we invaded almost 20 years ago, we didn't have a China that was building a Blue Sea Navy. We didn't have a Russia that was rearming. We should be focusing on attack and not attacking. We should be focusing on attacking the problem of combating the states that are our enemies and not be sending people off to be fighting these wars that we actually have very little chance of winning and that won't destroy and, and, our country. And, and you negotiate with your enemies, not, not with your friends. You know, that's the whole well, point. I, and I think it's important to realize the American people are war weary. They yes. want this settled. And President Trump made a commitment to do this. And we have seen a thousand Taliban killed in the last 10 days. And what the President and Secretary Pompeo have tried to do is to get the Afghans working together the Afghan government right. saying, Taliban, you have to separate from Al-Qaeda and drawing some distinctions. And I think one of the things, Steve, that people are realizing is Donald Trump is not afraid to walk away from a bad That's deal. A, yeah. Yeah. See, he can define a bad deal and he is into finding some lasting peace. This was a bad deal. He showed North Korea he'd walk away from a bad deal, China with the trade talks. He has said, you know, I'll walk away from that deal. So the Taliban, the Afghan government, they need to realize if conditions are not met, and he has always said, we'll leave 
on conditions based it will be according to mm -hmm. our commanders in the field and if it's a bad deal we'll call it a bad deal and I'll walk away. All right, very good summary there. Uh, lots more big issues to get to, but there was some other national security news today, which hasn't made any headlines, but it really should. It's the latest revolting example of the swamp in action in the form of the revolving door. And one of our, until now, most respected military leaders. We have a Swamp Watch update for you tonight mm -hmm. on General James Mattis. <laughs> Over the last week or so, General Mattis has been running around hawking his book, but it was revealed today that he's planning to cash in on his government service in a much more swampy way. It was reported by Axios that Mattis is joining the Cohen Group, a massive advisory firm started by another former Defence Secretary, William Cohen. Here's how the Cohen Group describes some of its services. Quote, understanding and intervening to beneficially affect political, legislative and regulatory issues, including shaping public policy debates, maneuvering through regulatory processes, development of standards and regulations, securing public sector funding, also known as lobbying. It's quite the fall from grace, from mad dog Mattis to swamp lobbyists. But worse than that, it's not even lobbying for American interests. Here's the aerospace and defense page of the Cohen Group's website. Amongst other triumphs on behalf of its clients, it lists assisted US and Indian firms to develop a partnership to manufacture military aerostructures in India advised a German aviation firm on its acquisition of a 49% stake in a U.S. commercial air carrier, assisted an Indian firm to partner with a U.S. firm on the manufacture in India of night vision equipment, secured CFIUS approval of a French acquisition of a leading U.S. maker of aerospace composite tooling, assisted an Indian aircraft manufacturer in aircraft sales to U.S. state and local government agencies. Well, isn't that Fantastic. General Mattis is now taking his years of taxpayer funded government service to a firm that boasts about shipping defense manufacturing jobs overseas, selling American defense companies to the French and the Germans, and lobbying state and local governments in this country to use your tax dollars not to buy American, but to buy Indian. What the hell is Mattis doing going from defending America to selling out America? Now, it's only fair to note that the Cohen Group does also talk about helping American companies, and I guess it's possible that General Mattis has insisted on a clause in his contract that limits him to such work. But even if that's the case, and he's welcome any time on this show to tell us, it's shameful for him to have anything to do with this swampy firm that shows no loyalty to the country that put it where it is. If you agree, have your say at Steve Hilton X and at Next Rev FNC. All right, next, another even worse example of the swampy revolving door, this time involving a former Obama official and China. And don't forget, a surprise special guest later in the show. You're going to love who it is. Don't miss it. See you soon. Here is a story that goes to the heart of everything we focus on in this show. Where does power really lie with we the people or the anonymous bureaucrats and technocrats and lobbyists and power brokers in big government and big business who for 50 years have run the world in their interests? This is what the populist revolution is all about. The votes for Trump in 2016, Brexit, many more around the world. A huge part of it is national sovereignty. As President Trump puts it, America first. That is a massive change. Establishment leaders did not put America first. They put global corporations with their global interests first. That globalist ideology still infects much of our system. And here is the single most shocking example I've seen. We've told you about it before, but nothing happened. Nothing changed. So tonight we'll have another go. And importantly, alongside someone who's been a fantastic ally in this fight, Senator Marsha Blackburn, because this scandal is about Huawei and China where she has led the way for years. This scandal and the broader question of what to do about Huawei is about whether we have the will to fight China's plan to topple America as the world's superpower or whether we just meekly give in. As we've shown you many times, the brutal authoritarian regime in China has a stated aim and specific plans for world domination economically and militarily. They know that America is the only thing that stands in their way and that technology is the only way they can defeat America. 
That's why for over a decade they've been building up their technological capabilities, often by stealing ours overtly and covertly by spying. A central component of that strategy is the telecom company Huawei. All you need to know about Huawei's threat to America is contained in the summary of an academic study published in July this year. Quote, Using a unique data set of CVs, this paper analyzes the relationship between key Huawei personnel and the Chinese state security services. Based on an analysis of this data set, I find there is strong evidence that Huawei personnel act at the direction of Chinese state intelligence and that there exists a deep and lasting relationship between Huawei, its employees and the Chinese state. This should raise questions within Western governments worried about Chinese access to domestic information. You can say that again. In the light of this new evidence, the shocking national security scandal we told you about a few months ago is now a national security crisis that demands an immediate response from our government. This man, Samir Jain, was President Obama's head of cyber security. He is now a lobbyist for Huawei on cyber security matters. As our friend Congressman Mike Gallagher, a frequent guest on this show, put it in a letter to FBI Director Christopher Wray, Mr. Jane's seniority and intimate knowledge of US cybersecurity policy are now in the service of a state-directed company that, according to recent reports, has received funding from the National Security Commission of the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Liberation Army, and Chinese intelligence services. I am deeply concerned that his current employment may jeopardize American national security and undermine efforts by the United States to rally the international community against threats posed by Huawei. Now, Samir Jain is not some freelancer. He's a partner at prestigious Washington law firm Jones Day. Full disclosure, a firm which also has a partner who's a good friend of mine who's represented my company in the past and which also represents Fox on various matters. Like many other giant global firms that mix legal and lobbying services, Jones Day includes foreign governments amongst its clients. But as I've said many times, foreign governments have ambassadors. They have embassies. Why the hell do they need lobbyists as well? Now, here's what in many ways is the worst thing about this. It's all completely legal, completely above board. Nobody broke any law or contravened any regulation, not Samir Jain, not Jones Day, not Huawei itself. Still, I would argue, given that China is clearly America's enemy and has been at war with us for decades, that helping Huawei amounts to aiding and abetting an enemy. So, what is the right way to handle this obvious national security crisis? Certainly not what we have now. The stupid laws of our stupid leaders have created a system that gives the appearance of accountability without the reality of accountability. They call it transparency. As long as people like Samir Jain and companies like Jones Day openly declare that they're working for foreign entities, there's no bar on them doing so. The idea is that transparency will bring the accountability. If there's a real problem, the transparent disclosure of any activity will be enough to prevent harm. But that is obviously false. In this case, Samir Jain and Jones Day did everything by the rules. The reason we know about them working for Huawei is that they disclosed it in a filing under the Lobbying Disclosure Act. They operated the system exactly as intended. And then so did I. I brought the transparency by reporting on this scandal on this show. Twice, actually. The president saw it and tweeted about it. And what has been the result of all that? Absolutely nothing. There's an old saying, the dogs bark, but the caravan moves on. That's what the policy of transparency means in practice. Nothing. Right now, as we speak, despite the LDA disclosure, despite the exposure on this show, despite the president weighing in, Samir Jain, President Obama's head of cybersecurity, will go to work tomorrow to help America's number one enemy lobby on cybersecurity. So let's be clear. Transparency doesn't work. The formal process is set through the Lobbying Disclosure Act, and the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA, are a waste of time. We need clear and simple rules that put America's interests first. Congress must pass legislation that will prevent former government officials like Samir Jain and firms like Jones Day from helping America's enemies. Congressman Gallagher has introduced such legislation, the Congressional and Executive Foreign Lobbying Ban Act. Here's what President Trump had to say about this issue. Don't you think that should just not be allowed, that you shouldn't be allowed to lobby for a foreign government? Well, in that I way? would be all for that. I think it should be a lifetime ban. You know, some people say five years. We're putting in for five years. But, you know, it's very hard because the same people that are working in government, they work in government and then they go and they take these unbelievable jobs. That happens with me, too. They, you know, they're, they're part of your campaign. All of a sudden they're working with these big... 
and it's a very tough thing. You know, there's a very fine line. But I would love to see a five-year ban, but I'd actually like to see a lifetime ban. Good. Now let's make it happen. And that's where you come in. Politicians respond to pressure from their constituents. So tell your members of Congress you want to see them pass Mike Gallagher's bill. Go to this website, contactingcongress.org. Just type in your zip code and it will show you your senator and house representatives and their contact details. But while we campaign for new laws to prevent this kind of thing happening again, we mustn't let it just slip by with no accountability or consequence. We asked Samir Jain to come on and explain himself, but needless to say, he was too contemptuous of the American people to bother. Well, let's tell them how we feel, shall we? If you're a member of Congress watching this tonight, and I know many of you do, or if you work for a member of Congress, the next time you talk to anyone from Jones Day, tell them what you think of their decision to accept Huawei as a client. And all of you watching can tell them directly through their public communication channels. You can tweet to Jones Day, at Jones Day, or leave a message on their Facebook page, at Jones Day Law Firm. The Samir Jain scandal is the entirely logical and predictable outcome of the globalist philosophy that has captured the levers of power in Washington. Loyalty to America is not expected. Global interests, in this case those of a global telecom company and a global law firm, are superior to the national interest, but it has to stop. We mustn't just let this be something on TV that we get angry about for a moment and then the world moves on. In the short term, perhaps the president and his team can implement some kind of immediate ban for this particular case. But the long-term answer has to come from Congress. So let's keep up the pressure. I'm going to put all the details we mentioned up on the screen again. There they are, so you can make a note. And we will make sure to post it on our Facebook page and put it out on Twitter. So please follow us at NextRevFNC and at Steve Hilton X. And please, please take action tonight or tomorrow. You can be sure that we will keep fighting this one hard until we get the changes we want to see. Senator, you've been on this for years, as I mentioned. Yes. I'd love your response specifically on this particular case and then on the broader question of Huawei and what we should be doing about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I think that with this case, it is the epitome of the swamp. And this is why Drain the Swamp resonated with the people. And President Trump is exactly right on this. And I hope we do see Mike Gallagher's bill move forward. Here's what we have to realize. China owns Huawei. This is a state-owned yep. company. In China, you do not know where the military ends and the commerce sector begins. They are one in the same. And what they are trying to do, what Huawei is trying to do, is buy credibility. Yes. So this is why they have somebody out here lobbying for them. What I've been trying to do for years, as we've talked about, is block them. This is why we do not allow the U.S. military or our allies to use Huawei. Huawei is embed spyware into their hardware and whether it's their telecommunications transmission uh, com equipment mm -hmm. or their co um, commercial items that are for consumers. They are embedded with spyware. They can track you. They can follow you. Why is this dangerous to us? Because as we launch 5G, as we launch artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, we do not want the Chinese and Huawei and China with their allies, Russia and Iran and North Korea, to know what we're doing. So should we be blocking Huawei all across the board? Absolutely. We should not allow them at all, not mm -hmm. one little bit, into our telecommunication system. They are setting up their foundation for cyber warfare, which they fully believe is the way they're going to move to dominance. So we're right to block them and to keep them out of our systems. Very clear. Are we currently blocking them sufficiently, in your view? I don't think we're blocking them sufficiently. But I tell you what, we don't need to let them have any gain any more footholds. We need to make certain that where there is Huawei equipment that is used in our system, and bear in mind what they do is basically give their equipment away. And it doesn't matter if you're in Central America or South America or over in Europe. You're going to see Huawei's presence. And they say their equipment is very affordable, and with 5G coming, they're going to be the leader. 
Why do they want that? Because they can thereby capture your data. When they capture your data, they capture your virtual you, you and your presence online. So we can't transmit sensitive data over their network. And Obama's cyber security guy is helping them do all this. All right. It's this one. I mean, Henry, um, quickly on, the, on this point, uh, it seems to me it's got tangled up with the trade war. Um, China wants that, you know, and that's how haggle back and forth. How do you think it should be handled? Do you think it, it's okay to use Huawei from our point of view as a bargaining chip in the trade war? Or are these issues so serious that you've got to say, no, we're blocking Huawei, whatever, and we'll deal with the trade issues separately? The latter, I think, you know, look, data is power. And okay. this is a techno totalitarian state that makes no secret of its desire to become the leading global power. You give them data, you give them power, you give them any sort of foothold and they can use that against us, they can use that against private citizens and we need to marshal our allies to keep them out regardless of the other trade deals that we cut with China. So I can't resist this, I've just got to, do we, do we have our favorite uh, former vice president and his connection to China, do we have that ready to go? Please can we just, please can we just uh, see that because um, Joe China, compromised by the Chinese government, um, running for the president with all this going on that we've heard about. I mean, well, I also think it's insane to try to divorce Huawei from the Chinese government. I mean, you cannot be a, a company like Huawei and be as successful as you are in China without an incredibly cozy relationship with the Chinese government. You also have laws like the national intelligence law, which literally allows China to go to companies like Huawei and say, give me the data, give me the information. Yeah. I want. And if you talk to anyone in this space, like I did earlier today with Congressman Will Hurd, who's former CIA, they will tell you that the, those concerns, cybersecurity concerns, that connection between Huawei and the Chinese government. And you also talk, I talked to the White House today as well, reiterating the concern that Huawei is under the thumb of the Chinese government. And it's also uh, even beyond the fact that Huawei is just a company that we have bigger issues with. You look at the Justice Department going after the, C, the CFO of Huawei for skirting sanctions with Iran. You also look at the Justice Department going after Huawei for trying to steal trade secrets from T-Mobile as well, which also gets to the heart of the broader issues we have with China and the stealing of intellectual property right. theft, forced technology right. transfer. And not only that, but the UK put out a report putting Huawei on blast for the fact that their 5G isn't even a secure network, right? So it's not even the fact oh, the whole thing that there's see these it's security it's concerns. We, it's a, it's a design. subpar product. Yes. I know. Well, I'm so sorry. We've got to leave it. But just, yes. the way I want to leave it is that the Democrats are talking about nominating someone who's going to be a sort of open door for all Which, this. It's, I mean, should know if, better, if he's the nominee, the I'm telling space. you, this one, this China issue is going to be the issue if they nominate Joe well, Biden. Or, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You have to go. But we come back to in a second. All right. Coming up, all you hear about from the establishment it's how Trump's trade war is hurting the economy. But what about Trump's trade peace? The new deals he's done that Congress won't approve. Wouldn't passing that help the economy? And stick around for our special surprise guest. I won't judge you if you do pirouettes when you <laughs> yeah. find out who it is. All right, don't go away. Democrats and the establishment media never stop going on about how Trump's trade war is hurting the economy, even though China started the trade war decades ago, and President Trump is in fact the first Western leader to take them on. But if these anti-Trump hysterics really cared about the economy, they'd focus on what's sitting right in front of them, trade peace in the form of the president's USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. But Congress hasn't passed it. You're back there tomorrow. What's going yes, to happen? Yes, we <laughs> are. I'm telling you. What Donald Trump is doing is trade done right. And that's what people want to see. The USMCA has a tremendous amount of bipartisan support. If you're with me in Tennessee, you've got the UAW, you've got Teamsters, you've got the Farm Bureau, you've got the Chamber of Commerce. Everybody is saying, put it on the board, call the vote. I've had Democrats tell me they think it'll get about 300 votes in the House. They're very positive about it. I don't know if that's the right number or not. There's a lot of support in the Senate, but Pelosi ought to put so it's it got on to the start board. In the call Is that the, the procedure? It's yes. got to be, so what's she needs gonna, to call the vote. What's she playing at? Well, see, I, I think the challenge is that, well, what's the good news for Americans right now is it would be a boost to the economy, something like 160,000 jobs, $68 um, billion permanent uh, growth to the economy, so it would be a win for Americans, but that's also why you could see Nancy Pelosi not wanting 
to move forward on it because it is a win for Americans. And if it's a win for Americans, it's also a win for President Trump. And sadly, I think that is what is at issue so with Democrats and with Nancy Pelosi. And I think that is the reason why Nancy Pelosi would want to spike it right now and wait till after 2020 to deny President Trump that victory. And then also by denying Americans that victory as well, which is sad. Uh, but that's where we are with politics. Yes. Well, I mean, what's their ostensible reason for blocking it? Well, I think the ostensible reason is the usual one, that some of the unions would like stricter uh, guarantees on jobs and some of the environmentalists would like stricter side guarantees on environment. But the fact is Nancy Pelosi's majority rests on congressmen from marginal districts that have voted for Republicans in the past that are very pro-trade and particularly pro-trade with America. She needs to start hearing from people like Harley Rauda in Orange County and Lizzie Fletcher in Houston and people whose elections depend on getting moderate Republicans who are pro-trade to pull the lever for them again. And once she starts hearing from them, it'll get on the floor. Because the whole point, again, it's a very, it's a very personal thing. And this is probably another reason why they don't like it, because the, is, is the president delivering his promises. He said, look, NAFTA's a disaster. I'm going to improve it. He's very methodically going through his promises and he improved it. And here it is. And that's what they don't want. Well, but this is what the American people do want. And when you look right. at the economy numbers for August and you look at 3.7 percent unemployment, that is the 18th straight month that we have been under 4 percent. So you do this. So it picks up ag trade with Canada. It helps with the auto That's manufacturing really uh, situation and it gives you more uh, activity and wages are going to continue to increase. That is a good thing for American families. And right now, what they want is to be able to say, all right, we're going to yeah. have a bigger paycheck last year than we did the year or next year than we did last year. They and want they, to see that economic growth. Well, we'll see. We're going to keep following it because it's very important. All right, coming up, you won't want to miss our surprise special guest. Oh, it's, the <laughs> moment is nearly here. <laughs> Who is it? There, I'm not going to say it's a he or she, maybe you can work it out. They're joining us for the second half of the show, coming up in a minute. All right, the wait is over. She is here, our surprise special guest. Look who it is, author of the new book. Oh, they're putting it on the screen. Am I holding it up? That's totally pointless. <laughs> Radicals, Resistance and Revenge. The left, so I'm going to hold it up anyway. The left plot to remake America. Judge Janine Pirro. There's the book. Here's the judge. Yes, hello. How exciting to have that you here. That was me. I've never been in silhouette before. How bad was it? I thought it was great. Did I don't know if like anyone me? worked it out. You yeah. know, it was great. They told me to move my hands. <laughs> and I, was, and I, well, I just wanted to make sure it looked like a real person, not like some weird blob that had gone wrong. So come on then. I saw it's you. It's good You're, to have you in New York. It's so nice to be here. And you were there, I think literally in that chair. The, I was watching you. I'm with Tucker and you were talking about something and you put the book out. He, he didn't ask you about the actual damn book. <laughs> and I say, ask her about the book. Yeah, but so, you know what? I won that. I won the prize on Tucker. I won that. Uh, oh, because they missed. I didn't cup. see it. That was the next day, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, mean, I, I won the cup. De Blasio. Well yeah. done. Yeah. You beat Jesse Waters, I think. I beat Jesse, yeah. Very good. I don't know whose face is on that cup. What, do you know the guy's name? I think it's someone from the Washington Post, which you are, you're quite keen on the Washington Post right now. Because I am. I love the Washington Post. You know why? They can count. All right, they have me number one on their bestsellers list. So I'm very proud of the WAP. Even WAPO though you effort. just gave me the figures, New York Times have put you number three, even though you are way ahead of the person who's number two, Michelle Obama, interestingly, like more than three times as many sales. Right. And ahead of the person who's on their list, number one. Right. So why is this book doing so well? What is in this book? Well, you know, the, the book is a follow up to Liars, Leakers and Liberals, where I, I focused on the, the head of the DOJ and, and the FBI. Yeah. You know, my wheelhouse, criminal justice. Yeah, yeah. I was a prosecutor, a judge, DA, all that stuff. So I kind of stepped back from it and I said, you know what? There wasn't just a plot to frame the president. There is a plot as I step back to remake America. Uh -huh. And I looked at it and I said, you know, it's happening uh, in, in, in our very eyesight. I mean, you could see it's happening to me. First Amendment, they want to top, uh, stop us from speaking, take us off of Twitter and Facebook. And then they send in Antifa, the bunch of bozos, uh, you know, dressed up in ninja outfits with, with masks on yeah. to assault us if they don't like what we're saying. And then the, the police are told to stand down.
down. So you've got Antifa beating us up. You've got people throwing us out of restaurants. You've got uh, Maxine Waters saying, you know, get That's in their right. face. We've almost and forgotten we, about that. That's yeah. right. Exactly. And, you know, if you see them, get in their face. And so we're under attack. Then the most fundamental right we have as Americans yeah. is free speech. All right. And then when you move forward, and again, this is close to my heart, the presumption of innocence. When we look at what happened with Brett Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. this man is as close to an altar boy in any adult man that I've known in the last maybe 30 years. Right. And so oh, he's not an altar boy. He's a gang rapist. He's not a circuit court judge. He's a gang rapist. He's not entitled to the presumption of innocence. Just ask that United States Senator Maisie Hirono. You know, the United States Senator is the most prestigious club in the world. Yes. 50 people. Okay, she says, all women need to be believed and men shut up. What happened to the justice system? So do you think, so you're, the, the subtitle, the left's plot to remake it, do you think that they're, th this is organized, you know, that they're working with each other, these different components of what they're doing? Well, I think that their hate for law and order, and I remember when Donald yeah. Trump in 2016 talked about running on a, on, a, on a platform of law and order, near and dear to my heart, I love it, okay, but I'm like, that's interesting, and then the farther we got away, or the further we got away from 2016, I said, you know what, he was prescient. He right. knew that law and order would be assaulted. He knew that there would be no respect for uh, the laws of this country. Look at what's happening at the southern border, yeah. you know, where the illegals are coming in and basically saying we want education, medication, housing, give us food stamps. And all you people over there who are waiting in line, paying your way, waiting for the visa, you know, learning about America, swearing allegiance to us, you just stay over there. We're all coming in. It is. It's just across the board. All right. Board, well, and, and we've got a couple more examples we're going to uh, talk about later. Yes. So, will you stay? And talk about. We've got the hats thing and the MAGA hat. And well, we've got I'm so excited change. that you're here from California. I'm not. I'm there staying. You are. She's staying. All right. <laughs> coming up. According to the loony left, the color red is now off limits. The full story next. I'm not going to tell you the joke. <laughs> Janine, Janine just landed me, landed on me just before we came back. Anyway, look, you wouldn't think people could still be persecuted for their political beliefs in America in 2019, but here we are. The public shaming of Trump supporters is this week's Looney Left. All right, exactly as the judge has been saying in her fantastic book that we were just talking about, this president has been vilified by the media establishment since before he was even elected, and now it's become acceptable to treat his supporters that way. In a recent Facebook post, somebody threatened to make public a list of 100 Pittsburgh businesses owned by people who support this president. The page was later removed, but local media reported that a website then popped up promising to do the same and even include tips on how to get those specific Trump supporting businesses shut down. These people are no doubt inspired by the boycotts launched against Equinox and SoulCycle last month after the Washington Post revealed their owner was going to be hosting a Trump fundraiser and they're egged on by the authoritarian behavior of people like Congressman Joaquin Castro tweeting out a list of Trump donors and Hollywood fascists like Deborah Messing launching vile efforts to out political opponents. And this week, an author who was once a Pulitzer Prize finalist tweeted out, is anyone else made really uncomfortable these days by anyone wearing any kind of red baseball cap? Like, I see one and my heart does weird. I'm not going to say it. And then I finally realize it only says tight list or whatever. Maybe don't wear red caps anymore, normal people. So it's very clear. The loony left is now the home of intolerance, bigotry and hate in America. This is exactly what you're talking about. The, the, the left and the way they're behaving. It, well, you know, and they say there's no such thing as a Trump derangement syndrome. I mean, really? I mean, all for the crime of supporting the president of the United States. We need to be outed, lose our jobs. Um, you know, Steve Ross, who has a successful business and, you know, creates opportunities for other people to work. You know, all, all these people should lose their jobs. It's McCarthyism, like they're it's Deborah exactly Messing. Right. I mean, you've, yes. been, you know, you've yeah. been in politics a long time. Mean, you know, we've always had this concern, you know, the, the way that the left typically, you know, when we disagree with 
liberals, we disagree with their ideas, whereas the left typically say, no, you're a bad person. You know, we're used to that, but there's the level of it. Well, is and, different you now, know, the it? censorship that they practice online and uh, that affects us all. But I have to tell you, I think that what we're seeing with this presidential cycle and the Democratic candidates, it is the lollapalooza of bad actions and bad ideas. I've just never seen anything quite like it. And uh, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to their health care policies, you name it. And they are doubling down on the censorship and the uh, banning of ideas coming. They're saying, don't talk to me. My mind is made up. I'm not open-minded. I'm not tolerant. It's unbelievable. I have decided that I am against Donald Trump. I am against these free market ideas, so don't even talk to me about it. And they it. constantly lecture everyone else on it, hate and bigotry and intolerance. They are yes. absolutely the worst, right? Yeah. Well, and then you look at what San Francisco did this week. San that Francisco. was the joke that Janine made, but I'm, I'm not going to go there. Yes. San Francisco. Okay, come on. <laughs> well. Do you want to talk San Francisco? I'm going to take my dogs to walk on the street because of the human poop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, 11 Democrats all, labels the NRA a domestic terrorist organization. Right. Re write, I wrote a column in the Post about this. The resolution says anyone who's a member is basically committing a terrorist act, and they're going to use the power of the government to get people to stop giving to the NRA. That's unconstitutional. This is, well, Harry Reid was a member, wasn't he? Like, literally the leader of the Demo Democrats in the Senate. That's how far they've gone in just a few years. Yeah. And, and you know, as if, as if they think they have the authority to designate anyone as a terrorist organization, and as if they don't have anything better to do, given the mess. I mean, they're they're they so we... emboldened because the media, the mainstream media, is with them. Yeah. Yeah, Every right. step exactly of the right. way. That's exactly and right. And they're emboldened. And by yeah. the way, I said 50 in the Senate. It's 50 states, 100 senators. 100 senators. Per yeah. per perfect. Okay, good. Um, well, look, we, when we started using loony left, you know, we thought, okay, maybe that's a bit out there. They're literally proving us right every single week. All right, coming up. The 2020 Democrats fall over themselves on climate change. But do any of them even know the facts? That is next. All right, earlier this week, the major 2020 Democrat candidates put their green pandering hats on and talked about the end of the world. In the view of the scientists who have studied this issue the most, we are fighting for the survival of the planet Earth. We've got, what, 11 years, maybe, to, to reach a point where we've cut our emissions in half. It's the existential threat of not this generation, but the whole world. The existential threat that exists. We don't move on it, number one. It's just incredible. It reminds me of that thing in Flash Gordon. Go, we want 24 hours to save the Earth or something. <laughs> it's just insane. Yeah. No, it's totally insane. They, they, they can't really believe it because there's something that they can do right now to decarbonize a lot of the economy. It's called nuclear power. But if you listen yeah. to all three of those people, all three of them, Sanders, Warren, and Biden said, no, we're not going to have nuclear power as part of the program. They're not serious I mean, about look, this. Republicans yes. are, pro, you know, we, we care about the environment, clean air, clean water, conservation, whatever. When they talk like this, it just puts everyone off. Well, they want to use their Green New Deal to control every minute detail of your life. Like I said, the Lollapalooza of bad <laughs> ideas. Yep. That is what you have with this group. No red meat, get rid of cars, uh, no air travel. Uh, the list goes on and on. No plastic straws. They're going to rebuild yeah. and rebuild. The whole thing is yes, absolutely is insane. And it's a just, as you said, and they admitted it, it was AOC's chief of staff said, this is not really about the environment. This is about uh, the economy and taking control of it. It's the massive centralization. That's, right. That's why they use the whole thing about the command. You know, they talk about World War II because they want this command economy, uh, which went with that. All right, there's just one other thing I want to sneak in here because uh, I saw this this morning. Um, Julian Castro, it's not really what he said. It was how he said it, uh, especially in the light of what he's talking about, which is excitement. Have a look at this. What I see is that, you know, Every time Democrats have won since 1960, they've won because we had a nominee that excited young people, brought together a new diverse coalition of Americans and was able to get that victory. I'm confident that I can reassemble that Obama coalition and then take it to the next level. Wake up, Steve. Oh my God. Is he finished? 
<laughs> I mean, what was that? He's literally talking about exciting things. He's like half asleep. <laughs> like he can barely finish the job. Yeah. We need to assemble. You're yeah. right. You're what? right. You're like, you, get, you go on a TV interview, you're talking about exciting. Just have some energy, man. Yeah. Well, the Democrats all have, they institutionalize everything, and they all have their talking points, and they all have the same things to say, and they keep tacking further left. And when you look at Republicans, they focus on individualism, they focus on great ideas. There's a lot of energy there. I think that's why you are seeing so many young such, people. Yeah, the, I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't stay with him either. I mean, you know, in a minute I was going to be down on the desk, you know. But 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 you know, he has. He's had a lot of energy. But yeah, everything they do is they just don't like America the way it is. They don't. They want socialism. They want everything other than what we have now. And if the world's going to end in what is it, eleven years, thirteen years? Yeah, I think the dates. Yeah, I'm going to start yeah. really eating those cheeseburgers. I'm yeah. not going to. I'm not going to work so out. So, Henry, you're just very quickly. Are you still on your point? Uh, you looking at the electoral map? You're saying still looking good for President Trump. He just has to get uh, some of the states he won before plus Maine. Is that right? That's all he has to do. All right, where you are. Well, that's simple, isn't it? All he has to do, uh, win the ones before. He doesn't even need all of Wisconsin, he all, Michigan, 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 or Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania one Wisconsin. of those three. All right, well, there three. you are. Look, we're out of time. The world's about to end. We've got we to get out and sort of save ourselves somehow. Um, thank you for watching.